Could I also bring up uh, Maddie Atkins, who was trained in Houston in 2016? <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. Uh, could I bring up David Elderberger, who was trained in Chicago in 2013? Great, David. And could I bring up Nina Furman? Nina's from Indonesia, trained in Melbourne, living in California. And with no further introduction, Al Gore. Thank you again, Don. Thank you. Well, wasn't that last uh, session great? He did a fantastic job. Wow. And I'm really looking forward to this session because these four climate leaders have already traveled the journey that you are uh, beginning now. They have a lot of uh, experience in spite of their young age, uh, and they've been through a lot. Um, first of all, uh, you all four have been uh, working as mentors here. Thank you for doing that, too. Thank you. And, uh, one of the things that uh, we always find is that the storytelling is really an important part of this. And I didn't give you any warning of this, but I'm wondering if, the, if each of you have a short version of your story that you'd be willing to, to share here. And why don't we start there and come this okay. way. Nana? So yes, uh, so my, uh, I always share the story that I was working in the post uh, tsunami disaster area in Aceh in Indonesia when I was uh, seeing a lot of devastated uh, victims uh, from this, uh, this uh, tsunami. And it was really hard to work with the people there. And at that time, I was trying to convey the message that we have to uh, do the rebuilding in a sustainable way. But somehow, people didn't understand my language. It's like I was speaking foreign language to them. And I realized that the people in Aceh are very religious. So I tried to explore from the religious teaching. And I use the wording and the narrative from, from uh, the faith-based uh, uh, scriptures. And somehow, people just, you know, like their bulb just light up. And they, they realize that, yes, he's saying something right. And we need to do like a better, uh, uh, a better way to transform our reconstruction. And that way also, like, I use that uh, kind of stories when I start uh, conveying the climate change issues. And before I go to David, I looked for an opportunity to mention this. Nana also um, went on to uh, not only be a climate leader, but she also uh, is the one person most responsible for the Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change, which has had a huge uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, forgive this uh, dad comment, but my oldest daughter, uh, Corinna Gore, is the head of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary, and she and Nana work together and know one another, so uh, the, the faith-based narratives uh, are, as many of you are well aware, extremely uh, powerful, particularly with, uh, with uh, certain audiences. But David, uh, your short story. Sure. I, uh, I grew up in a very outdoorsy family in, in Boise, Idaho, and one of my earliest childhood memories uh, is camping with them standing on a bridge over an inlet into Redfish Lake in central Idaho and watching uh, a stream of salmon, red salmon, uh, sockeye salmon, turn, uh, come into the lake to spawn. Uh, my mom told me, I, you know, I was wowed by this just seeing the fish, but uh, she said, wow, those are coming from the Pacific Ocean. You know that? And you know where that is? And I said, oh my, you know, it was like a miracle, right? <laughs> I mean, like how did these fish come all this way? Uh, and it was just a, a, a brilliant memory and then uh, by the time I was a sophomore in college, I was studying zoology. I had a, I have a long-standing love of wildlife. And uh, one salmon returned to Redfish Lake that year. Uh, the next year, none. And the next year, none. Uh, 
as I was as I was getting ready to graduate college, um, there was an election going on for my congressional district, and uh, a woman who was kind of reminiscent of Sarah Palin before Sarah Palin was cool uh, <laughs> was was running for that seat, and she did an endangered salmon bake in Salmon, Idaho, and I just thought that was the craziest thing in the world. Her her quote from that event was, uh, "Salmon aren't endangered. I can buy them at the store in a can," and of course, of course, those are Alaskan salmon. Uh, and, and I just thought, well, this, this person will never be elected. She's just too fringe, too crazy. Uh, does this sound familiar at all? Too, too fringe, too crazy? Um, <laughs> and uh, she did win. And I came home one, from work late one night and saw her uh, acceptance speech. The next day, went to the university library, looked up internships, found one with the Sierra Club, moved to Washington, D.C. with my goal of coming back to Idaho someday and beating her at her own game. <laughs> 22, 22 years later, I'm still in, in wildlife advocacy now with the National Wildlife Federation. But I tell that story not as a story of climate change, although salmon are definitely being impacted by climate change nowadays uh, with their temperature sensitivity and the water's warming. Uh, but I tell it as a change in my short lifetime to that point, human-caused impacts caused a whole species, a whole miraculous wildlife migration to cease to exist. Wow. Well, thank you for turning that, uh, that, that grief into a determination to make a difference. Maddie, what's your story? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a household that showed me an inconvenient truth when I was a very young kid, so I kind of always knew that climate change was a thing that existed. Um, but it was always really difficult for a young person like me to actually do something that felt like it mattered. Um, when I was in high school, it seemed like I should join the environmental club because I was like, I'm really passionate about climate change and this is something that needs to be stopped. Um, but we did things like make pine cone Christmas ornaments and I would come from the headspace of being like, the ice caps are melting and this is what we're doing. Um, so it was never very um, empowering to be a part of those, those groups. And then um, I just felt like I wanted to do something that felt big enough and felt real enough because this is the biggest crisis that humanity has ever faced. And I, I wanted to do something that actually felt meaningful in the face of that crisis, in the face of that magnitude. So I started working. Um, I was very fortunate to have amazing mentors when I lived in Indiana. Um, I actually dropped out of high school and decided to pursue this full time. Um, and I started working in public policy, working locally to write resolutions for reaching carbon neutrality. Um, and even in my all Republican city, um, recently that resolution was just passed unanimously. Great. So, it's sort of been this journey of trying to find um, actions that feel meaningful enough and to find amazing people to do it with. That's why I'm so grateful to have Climate Reality and to be a mentor and just to have met all of you. So. Well, good for you, Maddie. Thank you so much. Lucia. My story starts out a little weird. Um, <laughs> so I, I took environmental science when I was in high school. I hated it. It was a sleeper class. Everyone just slept the whole time. Um, I really, I, I, I was never really inspired by environmentalism until um, I started gardening. And I started gardening because I had a lot of digestive issues that suddenly came on. And I was having a lot of health issues that um, my doctors couldn't really identify. And so I started looking into natural health um, alternatives like Ayurveda and Chinese medicine. And they recommend eating seasonably and um you know, living in accordance with the laws of nature, and I realized how difficult that was <laughs> given our, the way our food systems are set up, and so I decided I wanted to start gardening, so I started, my journey started with changing light bulbs. It was very personal, and it was motivated by my own health, um, and I realized that I just loved living a healthy lifestyle, and I wanted more people to support that. Um, so at my university, I attended the University of Illinois at Chicago, and there was an urban garden on campus. So I joined the UIC Heritage Garden. And UIC is not uh, very environmentally or sustainability focused, but they're very social justice oriented. So um, it was out of the Latino Cultural Center, and 
Um, most of my first friends at the university were undocumented students. And so I started learning about the social justice connections with um, environmental justice issues and just became so um, motivated and inspired and realized that my love of gardening was so much bigger than wanting to eat healthy food. It was really this global issue um, that was that I needed to be politically engaged with. So I ended up interning with the Office of Sustainability where I got my first climate reality presentation. And that was my light bulb moment because up until then, sustainability was like this intuitive thing in my head. Like I understood don't trash the planet that keeps you alive, right? Um, but I really had, like I said, I slept through environmental science, so I really didn't understand what climate change was. And this was the first time I felt like I had a holistic understanding of what climate change was at a very basic level. It's not hard to understand, but um, you just need to get that basic information. And um, as an English major and as a writer, I realized that I finally found my niche as a communicator. Mm -hmm. And I was so, ex it was, that was my light bulb moment. Um, and I knew that I, I felt like I found my purpose in life. And so I immediately uh, signed up for the Miami conference and it was life changing. So. Um, I've been a mentor and have attended the conferences ever since and um, have continued to be more politically engaged and be a person that represents this issue. Good for you. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay, so each of you has been interacting at tables and with uh, small groups here, but I want to ask all four of you to share with the entire group what advice would you give to a brand new climate leader? Um, they will, will have the graduation ceremony uh, later today, and um, they are, they're looking uh, to put it to, to work. And uh, what, what, uh, what are they facing? What advice would you, would you give them? Whoever wants to go first. My first piece of advice would be, you have been given a golden key, and that is Al Gore's name. <laughs> I say, and I so, <laughs> thank you. Never heard that one before. <laughs> I, I swear to you, I'm in, like I said, I'm an English major. Um, I didn't have a lot of uh, environmental science classes I could take, so I didn't, when I left this conference, I was so intimidated because I didn't feel that I had credibility or that people, really took me seriously with my interests in sustainability. And being able to say that I attended this conference and I was trained by Al Gore, people got really interested. Um, and they, we were talking about this earlier, they think you're intimate friends with Al Gore. Everyone in my family yes. thinks I'm like best friends with Al Gore. Well, we all are. Yeah. Really? <laughs> so. Feel free. Uh. But, <laughs> but I really mean that to, to take yourself really seriously and you know, use, use Al Gore's name and go out and say, you know, I've, I'm a trained climate reality leader and really use that to your advantage because people will be interested and even if you don't work in the industry, that's fine because you have this training and that's what gives you credibility. Next, whoever. Oh, okay, I, I can go next. Uh, so, uh, like my advice would be um, know your audience and Start from something that they are familiar with or something that is close to their hearts uh, or their lives. Uh, don't, like if they're, like find it what is their, you know, like what is uh, the community or the audience that you're going to talk to. Whether they're interested in food, health, water, or faith, start from there. So, because, because most sort of, of the time, this is like happened to me, like uh, in the beginning of my uh, presentation, like uh, I was trying to give, I, gave to my mom's friends. This, this are, uh, these were women uh, housewife in Indonesia, and I was trying to give, you know, just intimate uh, presentation about climate change, but I was using the, the language of science, and they're just like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, you know, it's like, they're like clueless, and I realized I made a mistake because I didn't, I didn't, uh, uh, talk about uh, something that is close to their heart. And then I started with my mom because she loved gardening. I started to talk about, you know, gardening and what's the relation. Then she got it. Then I tried that, uh, you know, like knowing the audience. I think that's very important. 
Yeah, and, and before we go on to uh, David and Maddie, um, if you have a, a, a group of people, how do, what's the best way to get to know your audience? That's always uh, good advice, but there are different people in some audiences. It sounds like you had a group of people who had a similar outlook, but do you, you just pick that up by talking to them in advance? Yeah, so I usually like ask, if, if I get invited, I ask uh, the, like whoever invites me, like what sort of uh, like uh, audience that I'm going to uh, meet mm -hmm. and then like what is their background, like, you know, like so then I have like some ideas, so I ask question first, like where they're coming from, what they do, what do they do and where they live. So I have some ideas like, you know, like uh, what sort of uh, like audience that I'm going to, to meet. So those things. So I do like a little research before I give the talk. Mm -hmm. Unless you do like uh, elevator pitch, then you just have something maybe related to weather, then that, that could, you know, that always works. Mm -hmm. I, l let me just interject that I, I, I give a lot of talks and a lot of speeches and over the years I, I got some advice from someone who was a, a mentor many years ago and I will pass it on to you for what it's worth, it, not for everybody maybe, but I will uh, do research on my the, the, whatever group I'm talking to and I, I try to find somebody who's very familiar with the, the makeup of the group and what they're like. And I, I generally ask uh, three, three questions. I say, um, if you had to come up with a list of three things that this group, the whole group, feels really good about, what would those three things be? And they'll think and think, and some, it doesn't always work, but usually it does. And then I say, if you had to come up with three things that this group feels really bad about, well, and it's usually easier for them to come up with that. Uh, well, it depends, but, uh, and then I will sometimes say, if you could wave a magic wand and bring about one change in their thinking, the whole group, what, would, what change would you hope for? And then I will um, try to keep those, uh, the things they feel good about and the things they are, uh, you know, disturbed about in mind as I try to connect with them. And then, depending on what the magic wand question answer is, I'll, I'll try to weave that into the, the pitch that I give. But anyway, what advice would you guys give? Uh, well, a couple quick stories. I, uh, yesterday at my table, um, there's a very important vote coming up. Uh, Ken Berlin referenced it this, this morning, but uh, uh, there's a methane vote uh, in the Senate next week, early next week probably, to overturn the BLM regulations to control methane leakage. And I was encouraging my two Colorado tables to pick up the phone and, and call Senator Gardner and a, a couple <laughs> who's still undecided. And uh, we've managed to delay this vote because of Republican indecision on, on the tool that they're using to overturn this rule. But uh, so two of them were like, well, I've never called my senator before. And I said, wow, OK, uh, well, that's great. Like, let's do it now. And, the, and she said, well, what do I say? And I said, it's like six words, like vote no on the BLM methane CRA. And she said, OK, I, I, I can do that. That's cool. And she did. And, and then the other one called, and she said, I just put him on speed dial. And it was like, it was, <laughs> it was just that easy. But you know, one little act of leadership, there's, there's so many. And as you saw Elena present this morning, will lead to another and will lead to another. My, the first training I did in Chicago 2013 after we got back, a lot of people were so nervous about the holy grail of doing the presentation and how do I, where do I start with that and, and uh, I was working on advocacy around the climate action plan at that time and I booked a room at the Boulder Public Library. Uh, there was a person in, at one of my tables who uh, worked in the solar industry and I said you can cover the renewables aspects of the climate action plan and another, uh, another person at my table was a buildings expert and an uh, energy efficiency expert and I said you can cover the buildings and energy efficiency aspects, I'll cover kind of the overview of the plan. We, we got I think maybe 20, 25 people but it gave them that baby step of like oh I know this piece, I'm comfortable with this piece, yeah. I can present around this and, and they went on to do more and more and uh, I'm great. still in touch with those guys. That's so. great, that's <laughs> fantastic. Maddie, what advice would you give? say I have um, two pieces of general advice. Um, the first would be that you totally do not have to know what you're doing because I most of the time have no clue what I am doing. Um, but the important thing is that you just do it anyway. 
Because if you're walking on this path and you're like, I have no clue what's going on, that's how you know you're learning. You're, you're getting in the right, you're in the right direction. So um, I, I liken it to this metaphor of walking on a path in like a really, really dark place and you have a flashlight and all you can see is the very next step and you, you don't know what's out there in the darkness, but you can see very clearly this very next step. And that's all you have to focus on is you just have to take that next step. And the second thing I would say <laughs> is, um, is to take that step with the most undeniable persistence that anybody has ever had. I'm telling you, if, you're, if you want to get in contact with a city official and you send them an email and they don't respond, you send them another email the next day. And if they don't respond to you, you give them a phone call. And if they don't respond to you, you show up at their office. You have to do everything with that kind of undeniable persistence and then you will be unstoppable. We were talking backstage, and all four of you told me that you really enjoyed the indivisible presentation. That, that's a little bit about persistence also. Yeah, yeah. And, and you also showed me uh, something that I didn't know to feel confident, the power pose. Oh, yes. We learned like about that. <laughs> we all remember this. We gave this useful tip to Al Gore. We think he might need it because he gets a little nervous yeah. before his presentation. So yeah, they, yes, you can see we're also modeling the panel pose. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> we're practicing. <laughs> this is for you. So yeah, I've I, I've learned a lot from this training. I'll tell you, and uh, I I feel so much more confident doing this uh, panel after doing that. So. Um, how, what is, how do you work with other climate leaders? Uh, you, you're part of a community now, all of you, uh, and you've already learned from one another, but after you graduated from the training and you went out and started doing the acts of leadership, did you continue to be in touch and how did that go? How did you work with other climate leaders? Um, I think I have an answer to this. Um, so uh, when I was trained in Houston, a bunch of the youth that were there at that training got together and sort of formed a coalition that, I think they named it this in 2010, but we stole it. It's um, an inconvenient youth. No. Okay. So we, we all got our names on a spreadsheet and we decided that we were gonna stay in contact because youth have to stick together because our voices really matter in this movement. We are the moral authority, so we know that we're powerful. So we, we, we have continued to stay in touch. Um, we have begun working with um, the organization that I I'm a part of called I Matter Youth, which is a support network for youth activists. Um, and we empower them to take local action in their cities, things like resolutions, um, just to get their cities um, actually taking them seriously because this is not just about our children or our grandchildren, this is about our lives. This is my personal fight to make sure that the world that I live in will be livable. So just staying in contact with those climate reality leaders has really helped me to stay um, motivated. Seeing what they're doing and sending them emails and seeing them on video calls has been so amazing, so. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, after my first training, it was a, it was a life-changing moment for me. I had moved from, I'd lived in Bozeman, Montana for 12 years and worked for a number of organizations up there and had transferred down here. And my first year, you know, as an organizer, if you don't have a network, you're very helpless. <laughs> you can't get a lot of things done. And I came back from Chicago after that training and I had, you know, 40 new friends from Colorado that were eager to do things. And uh, still to this day, Colleen Cope, where are you? Uh, out in Fort Collins, uh, David Zeiler. Uh, I stay in touch with these people in, in, in places of importance and uh, I've had them take packets to their district offices when there's recess weeks so that that gets filtered back to the, the congressmen and, and senators. Uh, and uh, I've, I've stayed in touch. I've used them in presentations, as I said before. Um, we've worked together at different events. We were, we all went, took a, a busload or a carload of people over to the uh, coal leasing event in Grand Junction, which we won in coal country. I, and uh, first training, Jennifer Linton, who's a mentor here, and as woo, and as you as you might have experienced here, it's a pretty amazing place to be because serendipitously you'll meet the people who have the skills that match your skills and who can start projects with you. So I would definitely say take advantage of the connections that you have made here, follow up, and use the Climate Reality Hub. And I say that um, to 
for a few reasons. One is to, especially for actions going into the future, like marches. I mean, Washington will have a march, but we need marches in smaller cities too. So keeping in touch with people regionally, and also, like, I don't know if you ever go on Facebook and Facebook stalk your friend who like went to Peru and you're like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> the same thing can happen on Reality Hub, but in a very positive way. Like go to Brian Etling's page and be like, what am I doing with my life? You, it's, we are in a room of such passionate, motivated people with such ama amazing energy and using everyone here and all the people already in the network, um, as supports and as motivators to remind you to keep going. Because once you leave, you're gonna go back to your everyday life, you're gonna go back to your job, and you're not gonna be surrounded by people who totally support what you're doing or who really care. So, I mean, the internet is such an amazing resource that we have, so I definitely say use that and stay as connected as you can, and use Facebook and use the hub. Yeah, so I remember after uh, I was trained in Melbourne in 2009, uh, there were like uh, about 50 uh, of Indonesian back then uh, were trained by uh, Mr. Gore. And then we, we went back. That time, I just learned a little bit about 350 ppm. I had no idea before what was the 350 ppm. So I was sharing to my other uh, presenters uh, from Indonesia at that time. I said, like, hey, why don't we do something uh, like about this 350 ppm. And then, just happened, we work with the Ministry of Education. So, shout out to my uh, climate reality from Indonesia, led by Ibu Amanda Katili. So, we work with the Ministry of, en uh, of Education. We managed to do a 35 presentation uh, simultaneously in 35 universities in throughout Indonesia, from the east to the west. So that was like something that I've wow. never forget that's kind of like giving me confidence that, well, we could do it. And it was kind of like, his, we made history actually in Indonesia to do this, you know, like in, in throughout the university. So um, my next question to all four of you, what, uh, g do you have an example of really helpful feedback that you have gotten from one or more of you, you, the audiences uh, that you have presented to? I'd say audiences are, have been my best teachers uh, because they tend to point out uh, all the things I don't know. <laughs> and, and so my answer is very often, I, I, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll get back to you and you collect their information. Um, but I have just a, a huge list now of things that I've added to my presentation, information that I see helps and that people want to know. So, um, and you'll, you'll probably find that, that there is gonna be a lot that you don't know, but that your audience um, actually helps you, you know, helps educate you in terms of what you need to know. And it's, fi and it's fine to tell them if you don't know something, you just say it and then get back to them, right? Absolutely, because you're not, you're not a, I mean, some of you are scientists, I'm sure, but <laughs> you're, you know, you're not meant to be an expert. You're a facilitator. You're facilitating these slides. Um, and you don't need to be an expert on all the knowledge. So l right off the bat, letting people know that, you know, you're not an expert, but you're here to educate as much as you can is definitely, I think, a great thing to do at the beginning of the presentation, actually. Other feedback experiences? For me, uh, I think I can't underestimate the power of the personal story. I start every presentation with that story I told you at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, and it, it, it makes, it human, humanizes you in front of your audience. And uh, there's nobody that can object to your emotion uh, around, or your passion around an issue. So if you make that personal connection, everything you say after, they might not remember all the stats and all the science, and, but they remember your story and people connect with stories. So feel free to use that, develop that, uh, focus group that, <laughs> work on it with your friends and family, uh, and just, yeah, be human. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I moved to uh, I moved to United States in 2012. Uh, so as soon as I moved to the to to the U.S., uh, I was living in San Diego then. 
So uh, I was asked to write an article in the Muslim Women magazine for US and Canada. So I wrote about climate change. And so because they're interested in my profile, so they put me in the cover of the magazine and they mentioned that I was trained by Al Gore. So suddenly I become like famous. <laughs> so, so anyway then, so then I started like, you know, talking to the Imam in the Islamic Center of San Diego. I said like, you know, like we need to uh, uh, talk about climate change with, the, with the, the congregation. And then she's like, would you like to do it? I said, yes. So I did it. So I did so many times like presentation, talking. Sometimes we have movie nights. And just like sometimes I came to the mosque and people just come up to me like, oh, you know, we, I've done this such and such that you mentioned in your presentation. I said, really? What did I do? What did I say? I mean, like, <laughs> but people do that, and I feel good because, wow, people really listen to me. And then after three years of constantly talking, talking about climate change, finally the board of the mosque decided to put solar panel no. in the mosque, <laughs> and now San Diego mosque has the solar panel on the roof. So I'm proud of that. <laughs> That's great. Um, if anything, I just want to echo what David said about you know. Um, sharing your story is so important, and I feel like my first presentation was so bad, but just getting through that first really bad presentation, you will always iterate every single time you give a presentation and you learn so much more about what connects with an audience, and then even then you're going to have those embarrassing moments where you completely forget what you were going to say, but then you like mess up the slideshow, and then you're just like, okay, um, you know what, forget it. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, just continuing to go through that and let, letting yourself you know, learn, letting yourself be bad at first. It's totally okay. I, I had that moment when right. the slides <laughs> just didn't come out and you just have to keep talking. It's like, that's going to happen to you. So, you know, please. Get ready. <laughs> when I first started doing uh, slideshows, it was so long ago, uh, I had a, a Kodak projector mm. with uh, the slides oh, that you put in. Oh, and, uh, and uh, I was reminded of this when you said, you know, something will go wrong. It's really easy sometimes with those old slides to get them upside down and backwards. Oh, yes. And, and it's really difficult to change it during the middle of the slideshow. It's much better on a computer. But, Although I've uh, seen your desktop, and it's pretty hard when you try and change it in the slideshow, too. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. e easier, easier, though. So um, have any of you ever had times when you uh, felt discouraged or needed to recharge your motivation? Uh, listening to you, I'm thinking maybe not, but knowing that we're all human beings, I'm thinking maybe so. Have, have any of you ever had an, an experience like that? And how do, you, how do you get your motivation back up to the, to the level you, you want it at? Uh, yeah, well, November 8th, was probably the worst day of my life. Then I just, I had been feeling like already, you know, climate change was just not happening fast enough. Um, or uh, climate change was happening way too fast. Our action towards it was not happening fast enough. And just to have that happen, it felt like we had taken just this huge step back. And I had already been feeling so unmotivated as it, as it was. So um, I think for a very long time, I sort of just like had trouble even getting out of bed because it just felt so hopeless. Um, but then it, somebody told me this really, this really great thing, is that you don't have to be, you know, hopeful because it's really no better than being a pessimist because it's going to be great. But we all know that that's not true. And a pessimist looks at the future and says everything's going to go terribly. It's all going to be awful. We all know that's not true. What he said is to base yourself in reality in this moment. You know what is good and what is right in this moment, and whatever that is, you do it. And it's going to be an action that's small and that you can actually have control over. When we look at the federal level, it's all these problems that are so huge that we don't have any direct say over. So we feel powerless and helpless. But then if we go down to this present moment to our, to our local government level, we can immerse ourselves in issues that we actually can have a direct control over. Mm. That's good advice. Very good advice. As as an individual who works on this for my day job and, and my volunteer job and um, thinks about it constantly, 
you know, some days there's just not enough Prozac in the whole world to like get through, <laughs> get through the day. Um, I've, I've looked forward to this particular event. I mean, I, I look forward to everyone, but since the election, you know, I, I, uh, I come to this, these events and I just get so recharged to know that we are building an army around the world that's gonna, that's gonna solve this. Uh, I had a friend who I recruited to come to this training and uh, she's a dance teacher and a professional dancer and, and she, she saw my post on Facebook and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply and I said, great. And, and then she got in and she said, I got in. Like what in the world? Like I don't even know what I'm doing. You know, what am I, why am I coming to this? And, uh, and I said, that's exactly why you're coming to this because you are a dancer, because you know the arts, and we don't, professional environmentalists are not gonna win this battle. You know what I mean? We, we need every constituency on point, at the ready, doing the work. Yeah, that's great. O on point's a ballet term, isn't it? Yeah. Did you? <laughs> Julie? Did yeah. you intend okay. that? <laughs> um. I'd say one of my most difficult, well, this is just one moment, but I don't know if it was my most difficult, but it was recently, actually. So I, I just graduated from college a few months ago, so in my millennial hustle, I was offered some, um, some work right after I graduated from a friend of my family, and I didn't really know what I was stepping into. He just needed some, like, assistance with something. And so once I got to his house, I asked, oh, so what do you do? Um, I, I, don't, I have no idea what I'm actually going to be doing for you today. And, and he said, yeah, I'm an engineer. I've been working in oil refining for the last 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then immediately I was like, time to go. But I, just, <laughs> I decided to stay because uh, I live in a bubble, you know, like many of us. I, I don't usually have the opportunity to have those conversations yeah. um, that aren't like, yeah, oil sucks. Um, so, so I sat and for quite a few weeks, you know, I, I just asked him questions, and I didn't right away say like, "Yeah, I am going to a climate change conference in a few weeks." I, I just, though I did mention that, but I, I just listened as much as possible. And I think as leaders, one of the one of the most important qualities of a leader is to listen, and to um, know when to take a step back, and to, uh, to be willing to understand all perspectives and not think you are right. And so. Um, though it was really difficult because I found myself, I talked to him about climate change and he would have a, some rejecting point to it and talk about oil and how it's not sustainable and then he would have a point that we really can't ever get off oil and, and I was realizing my own limitations but it was also just a, such an enlightening experience and, um, and I think being willing to have those conversations and to understand um, all the perspectives in this in the conversation of climate change is really important. So definitely always opportunities within difficult situations. Well, thank you all for sharing that. Um, another question for all four of you. As you think back about the presentations you've made, uh, the, the audiences you've been with, what is the single most unusual experience that occurred to you? Well, that's <laughs> or the or the most or the or the most uh, or the most memorable uh, experience or exchange that that uh, took place. For, for me, actually, like uh, it may be this panel. I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> so like uh, so uh, some of the uh, like the audience uh, that I was giving uh, presentation were like. Uh, they're like senior citizens, so they're like leaders in their community. So I felt like, you know, kind of I was intimidated because they're all old people, and then I'm like so young. What what am I like back then? And like you know, like what am I doing? Like telling them what to do. I feel like I was teaching them, and so. But um, so it's kind of like they also have a little reserve. Like they're like, who are you to tell us this? But. Um, I think like after uh, after the presentation, after you know like the event finished, they actually some some of them came up to me and they called me and they said like thank you teacher and I'm like oh, I'm not your teacher but they actually like they said yes you are our teacher so I think that's like something uh, that is you know like you know like kind of like encouraging for me yeah that felt good didn't yeah, it? yeah. And can I add a little bit about like being uh, the the 
the other question. So like I guess like like Maddie and uh, uh, David like you know I, like all of us like no, November eight I was in uh, Marrakesh for COP twenty two so then you know like this like suddenly my phone was just full of messages and and then suddenly I got like contacted by journalists and um, you know like uh, like many of journalists trying to they said like they want to interview me because they said you're you're a woman. You're a Muslim, you're an immigrant, um, and you're a climate activist. <laughs> wow, how, do you su how are you going to survive this? And I was like. <laughs> and here I was in COP22 trying to work like, you know, I was having, I was preparing 1.5 campaign and those things, and so I was like, oh, wow, is this what I'm going to face in the next four years? So I was a little bit reserved after I, so I was working in, in, in COP22 until finish, but then I returned back to the States and I was like, wow, what am I, what am I going to do? So, but then I, I realized that, you know, we cannot just like depend on government because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, everybody wants to drink clean, you know, like clean water, uh, you want to breathe clean air, you want to eat healthy food, everybody wants to have, you know, like future, uh, like best future for their children, grandchildren, so we all ha want to have, you know, like the best thing for our lives. And so then also like, uh, like each of us can do something, can do something to make a difference. Maybe it's only, some people say that, what can I do? I'm just only one person or I'm on, we're only one family. No, think like, Yes, you are one person, but if one person uh, like you are 1,000 out there or 1 million out there and 100 million out there, 100 million family doing something good like you, you know, be active and do some, mm -hmm. uh, an action, then, you know, like, then you actually have the masses that make a change. So, you know, like, we need to, uh, to, uh, to do something and, you know, like, be active and um, and I believe you know like from from my faith there is like uh, there's a verse that says uh, in every difficulties there's ease uh, so I think this is the difficult time but I see a lot of ease because a lot of groups that never even talked to each other before now becoming together and they actually build communication and coalition so I think this is a, a good thing for us And you, uh, feel free, I, I think I forestalled the, uh, is, if, any, if others wanted to answer the question about motivation and getting that back, I think I cut that discussion short. But So if you wanted to respond to that, or the most unusual, memorable moment, either one. I think um, one vision was the first time I gave a presentation, mm -hmm. because um, I, I was surprised by how easy it was. Um, I know you said some, sometimes you're gonna fail the first time you do it, um, but I was so nervous and like a week, I was in the middle of my semester and I had asked an English professor if I could uh, give a lecture, give a presentation to one of my classes and he was open to it. Um, so like a week before I said, okay, I'm gonna set up the presentation. Well, I didn't do that because I was in the middle of my semester. So the morning before I set up the presentation and I shortened the slides and I hadn't really had a chance to look over them and I did review, I reviewed all the climate science and then I was like, okay, I have to go to class. Ugh. And um, and it's you will be so surprised and amazed at how intuitive the slides are. So even if you don't feel like you understand the climate science at all, I, I would say as long as you really understand those first few slides with the science, the rest of them sort of speak for themselves and you'll go off on your own riffs. And by the end of the class, I was, um, it was fun giving it to an English class because every other slide someone would jump in with like a philosophy about capitalism and it, it ended up being a really fun presentation. Um, but you know, having people come up to me at the end like all these English students that were closeted environmentalists that were like, oh, I didn't know you could combine these two, you know, yeah, yeah. that so, and that expressed interest. So experiencing just, experiencing what it's like to inspire other people is yeah. such an amazing feeling and 
again. That, that's great. And, and you remind me of one of the things that I like about using the slideshow is that the slides themselves rem remind you what to, what to say. You don't have to memorize everything. And just if you go over them in advance, and, and even if you don't, uh, it, it will flow. <laughs> it, it, it flows easily from one to the other. Did, uh, did anybody else have a response to that other question? Uh, the memorable moment, I think for me, I, it wasn't a presentation, but I, I had the opportunity and honor to help out at your booth and, and uh, at the Paris negotiations. And oh. uh, uh, I showed up and one of your staffers was like, look at this guy. He works on it, climate all day long and he takes a vacation to work on climate some more. And I was like, well, yeah. once you're committed, right? But uh, what a fantastic opportunity that was. I'm not always the most outgoing person, but I mean, we were, our ask was to, you know, tell world leaders to, to formulate a strong agreement and uh, which which happened thanks to your leadership uh, and uh, but I you know by the end of those two days I think I, I can't even tell you the amount of hugs oh, <laughs> I received right. from different people that yeah. I talked to and I that was unexpected but uh, you know there's so much enthusiasm around in this family and uh, in this movement and you're gonna be part of it now and uh, and I, I can't wait to see you out there <laughs> well, well, Nana, David, Maddie, Lucia, we thank you so much. Join me in thanking these climate leaders. Great job.